Hi, good morning. Uh, this is the Gardner Community Meeting. Today we have two topics. First, uh, Tim, Tim Schrodi will uh, give an overview on the concepts and architecture of the Gardner installer the team is working on, which uh, is called Landscaper. And then uh, Georgi will uh, give a quick hands-on introduction how to contribute documentation for Gardner. Uh, Tim, you can take over. Yes, thank you. Let me share my screen. Just one. Yep, I can see it. So, great. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Um, today, uh, I want to to give a overview about um, the Gardner installer or Gardner landscaper that we're working on for the past weeks. Um, so, we're also doing a POC currently, um, which will be open sourced in next days or weeks. Um, but today I only want to talk about the concepts that we're working on and um, yeah, the, the um, overall architecture about this. Um, but first I want to give, uh, I want to start with the um, big picture. So, so where we're coming from, because when we're talking about the Gardner product, it's not just the Gardner operator or the Gardner installer. We also plan to have some more features with that. Um, so for example, um, the support for the other Linux, um, Garn Linux and Flatcar, et cetera, is also part of the story. We're also working on uh, multi-node LCD, control plane migration, autonomous clusters, and all of this stuff is also part of the Garner product, which should also then go into the one, um, um, one Gardner, yeah, let's say Gardner product with the landscaper that is also shipped to the community. And with that, um, we then, um, also want to have it for the community. So which means that we want to replace um, our current installer, which is Garden Setup, um, and some old um, landscape setup, and this we want to replace. So we'll give it to the community. And with that, we also want to have a neutral foundation for Gardener and push it more to community and also have more, more open governance for that. So um, we'll also be more open with that and be more like a real product with real installers and upgrades and all that stuff. Um, that we're currently missing in Gardner. So let's start with what Gardner consists of because that were what we were coming from. So because when we are trying to define or coming up with a new architecture for the Gardner installer, we first need to, need to start with what components does Gardner consists of and what do we have to install? Because it's not just the Gardner itself, there are also many other components that are part of the Gardner installations. For example, when we start at the top, um, we also have, for example, some DNS, we have some, some certs, we have some ingress, some identity, um, audit logs. Um, then we're also set for a virtual cluster. That's how we deploy Gardner. So which means that we are currently depending on a host cluster. Um, but into that host cluster, we deploy a virtual cluster with no nodes. And there we register, or register the, the Gardner control plane against. Um, and all that stuff. So you see um, that the Gardner components are a lot more than just um, installing a Gardner into one host cluster. We are more. And um, we also plan to, to um, get rid of this one host cluster that we currently need, but this will take more time. So they will plan for autonomous clusters that are fully managed by Gardner or by the Gardner, uh, by the machine controller manager. Um, but this is not part of, of the landscaper. It's just another work stream that's going beside. Um, and I think will take a lot more time than, than the landscaper itself. So therefore, um, these are the components that we're working with and that we have to consider because um, as you might see there, we're not just working with um, one cluster or not just with Kubernetes clusters. We also have to interact with some other things. For example, with the cloud providers, um, where we have to create technical users or we have to um, create multiple clusters with the, with the topology, shoot the seeds, et cetera. Um, yeah. So this is just like a prerequisite that we have to, to consider um, that will take part in our um, architecture later and why we need that. So then what's the mission statement of the garden operator or the landscaper, how we call it internally. So, um, so we want a harmonized way to deploy and up the gardener across landscapes and environments. So, and what does this mean in our goals? Our goals are, we want a harmonized way to consume gardener. 
because for now we have no harmonized way. We have some customers or some, some community members that just take Gardner and created their own installation around it. So their own CI CD pipeline, their own updates, mostly manual updates um, and upgrades and all that stuff. Then we have some community members that take the garden setup which is which is fine but not really for a production use case because there's some critical uh, functionality missing like updates and upgrades and all of that we want to have a harmonized way so which means that we want to have one way to install update um, and upgrade gardener and its components itself and with that harmonized i also mean that we internally at sap want to have the same things um, as you externally so that we have to maintain these installation steps these automatic updates um, not two times so therefore we want one way to install it and also share it then with the community and have one maintenance there and we also want to have a continuous observability of health and problems because you know gardener is a fast moving system and we have a lot of movie components therefore um, observability um, of the health of these components is essential um, so, which means that we also have some, some monitoring part in it, but we also need some observability for the installer itself because we plan to, yeah, have some, some more observability um, about what's going on because you see in the, in the garden setup, this is sometimes not, not that good um, because it's a complex system and therefore we want to have better observability if everything goes, goes, goes right. Um, then we want to have well-defined components in the interaction. So which means that everyone from outside should be able to see what a component does and what um, and what configuration it needs. Um, because yeah, currently with, with Garden Setup, it's hard to, with the Acreamel, it's hard to, to um, see where where configuration is coming from and where data is, is flowing. So where does the data from some component coming from? Um, and this we want to tackle with defined um, components and the interactions. Then we also want to have extensibility in it because um, we think that we at SAP have some internal um, pieces or components that need to be installed with the gardener. And I think also other um, stakeholders have their own um, have their own components or their own their own yeah components in their landscapes that need to be installed. And we want to be that extensible so that um, everyone can add their components um if if they want to have them so there we want to be as open as possible and to not restrict um your current setups with that then we also want to avoid external dependencies so um, we don't want to um, create more dependencies on a gardener installation than we already have with gardener so therefore we want to be as small as possible and we're trying to reuse as much as possible as gardener itself already needs um, and then we have, uh, we want to do API and CLI first, just, just a heads up and we may do an UI later, but it's on our priority list um, really low. So just um, landscape itself and CLI first. Um, then I want to talk about the no goals. So what, what we're not trying to solve, what is not, uh, what is out of scope for, for the current landscaper. Um, so one thing that we don't want to touch is configuration management because we think that every comp uh, that every company or every every community member has their own way of co of managing configuration. So which means that as so a configuration management, um, I mean something like um, do they want to store the configuration in GitHub? Do they want to stay in GitLab? Do they have um, that thing involved? Um, and do they want to deploy it with any CI CD pipeline? Do they already have existing pipelines? Um, so therefore we want to do not have any, um, any preconditions on that. Um, so we do not care about any configuration management um, outside of, of the landscape. Inside the landscape, we obviously care, um, but outside we do not really care. We're just using like raw Kubernetes um, manifests. Um, then we also currently not in scope that we skip minor version upgrades. So which means that um, we're only planning to have um, or to support um, minor updates. So which means that you cannot skip any minor update version. So you have to install. Um, so if you want to, to install from, from Gardner 1.7 to 1.9, you have to first install Gardner 1.8. Um, and so, yeah, we do not have to, you cannot skip 
uh, minor versions um, because I think the, the maintenance there would be too much for us. So this is out of scope. Um, then we also do no automatic migration of garden setup landscapes. We're planning to have um, some books or some, some yeah, some play box on how to migrate things because we also have our internal landscapes that we need to migrate um, and have some some things to you have to take care about and maybe some playbooks, but there's no automatic migration of garden setup landscapes. Um, then currently also out of scope, what I talked about is autonomous um, Kubernetes host clusters. This is a other work stream and may come in the future. And currently also out of scope is um, secret and permission management. So, which means um, that we're currently not planning to integrate directly with Vault or any other of such systems um, that may come in the future, but it's currently not our top priority. And then the last thing is audit log. So as you might see in the first slide, I have, uh, there's also an audit log component, but uh, this is more like a proxy uh, because we think that there are so many audit log components out there or different audit log systems um and yeah we do not do not provide any um any gardener implementation of that for now um so therefore we stick with the kubernetes native things and yeah you can re register your own proxy as said these are for example um the extensible components that you can deploy on your own um but yeah not nothing out of the box from from our side there so then we have our then we, we are asked the questions, can we reuse anything that's already out there? So for example, can we just reuse something like Helm or can we just reuse Flux or anything like that? Um, but then we decided to go with a operator um, as of some specific reasons. So one reason is we want to have self-healing components. So which means that we want to have the observability of the health and all that stuff. Um, which is not possible with, with Helm itself. So, which means we, we cannot monitor anything that's deployed by Helm. We want to have like a more reconciling system and also self-healing system because that's part of Gardner. We want to automate as much as possible, uh, which we cannot do with any static system. Then we also want to have complex migration steps because as you might know in the past, um, Gardner had some complex migration that needs to be like real code that is executed in order to, to migrate these things. Um, and the stuff is also not really manageable with any solution out there. So for example, with, with Helm again, um, you have to do a lot of manual steps in order to, to get it, get it work. So therefore we need an operator. We also want to have support for multiple environments. So, which means that, you know, Gardner can, um, can be deployed across multiple landscapes and with the garden led also into fenced environments. Um, but this is all. But this is currently um, then also a manual task to um, deploy the garden net into this fenced environment, um, and therefore we also wanted to have this with um, with the operator covered or with the landscaper covered, um, and this is also not possible with any other system. And then we also our last point is we want a typed configuration, so which means that we want to control how data is flowing, and then and we also want to to. Um, have the observability where data is coming from and um, which component exports which data. Um, and this is also the most things that why we're using an operator and why we can't go with any um, system that is out there. So which means that we're too, we have two specific requirements and we have a too fast moving system um, and also two complex migration steps um, in order to just use like existing things. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, just ask them right right now. If um, if you do not understand anything or anything is unclear, just ask. Because now I want to start with um, the landscaper and the entities that we're coming up with. So on the base of our landscaper, um, we have a so-called data type. So data types are the, are the foundation of all our other components and they define the data. So which means that this is an open API with three spec where you can define data like you define a cube config, you define a certificate, a domain, AWS credentials um, in an open v3 spec manner. Um, and yet this is then everything that is built upon that. Because as said in the, in the beginning, we want to have a clear structure and we want to have um, better visibility and better defined or well-defined components. And this is one part of that. 
Then the next entity are definitions. So definitions are component templates, um, so to say. So they define how to how to deploy a specific component, which they do with these so-called executors. I will come to how executors work and what they are um, later. But for now, let's say these are the, the real work that is done. So they define how you define a component. And then a component also consists of an import configuration and export configuration. Um, and these configurations um, are just specify a key and a data type. So which means that you can see by the definition of a component, what the component needs and of what data type they expect the data to be. Um, and also you can see with the export config what a definition or what a component is producing. So if the executors run, they produce a specific configuration. And this is also defined in the export configuration, which is again a key and um, a data type. So which means that someone from outside do not really have to know what the executors do. Or how, to, or how the component is installed, but this can be really complex. Um, but you can see from the outside exactly what parameters are required and what, um, and what you get out of the component, but just looking at the definition. Um, and then we also have support for, um, for aggregations. So which means that a definition can be um, referenced by another definition. And you can also reference multiple definitions. Um, and with that, uh, we also want to have the possibility to um, create, yes, let's say aggregations, but these are the same data types. So which means you can mix um, the pure template of a definition with these executors and definition ref, um, references. So therefore we have like a more, um, we'll be able to bundle our things more and maybe have like one, um, one new component that may consist of other components. So which means that we can, um, we can uh, better share um, different functionality or different definitions. So these are like, as I said, the templates of how a definition or how a component installation can be described. But in a real system, we have a so-called installation. Installation is then a instance of a definition um, and it holds like a reference, obviously to the definition and a state. So which means that this is the real thing that is then installed inside a system. And also all definitions have their own installation. But instance of does also mean that you can have multiple um, installations of one definition in a system. So therefore we also um, wanted to have, um, or wanted to be possible to reuse some components. Um, and with this installation, it's possible because you just specify a template. And um, with that, you can like inst have multiple installations um, based on the same template in the in the same system. And the last entity uh, that I want to mention is the landscape configuration, which is just the configuration that is put from outside. So which means that some information that we need from you or from, from, from the operator in order to create the landscape. So this is, for example, the host cube config. This is the topology information, um, the AWS credentials that should be used to um, to create shooted seeds and all that stuff. So all these things that need to come from outside that configure the landscape, uh, which is also a different entity in our system. And yeah, this is once per, so there you can only have one per um, installation. Not installation, but one per whole landscape installation. Yeah. Um, and then how we imagine the, with this entities, how we imagine the gardener landscape. So we, wanted to have something like this. So with these aggregations, we have one aggregation, this is called a community setup. Um, and also there's a different version and this community setup contained then um, the whole Gardner um, landscape or community landscape that we're imagined to be. And what you see there, they're just examples, they're much more, um, but these are just examples. And what I want to show here is um, that with that community setup 1.1.0, um, it will include the virtual cluster with version 1.0.1.0 uh, and Gardner with version 1.7 and the Gardner dashboard with version 0 0.30. So which means that then when we ship the community setup to you, so which means the community setup can be consumed by, by anyone, um, you will get these components. And with these components, we also test the bomb. So which means that we test that Gardner with version 1.7 
works perfectly fine in the installer with Gardner dashboard uh, 0.30.0. Um, and there we also let our whole test matrix that you also see in, uh, in the test grid run against the setup. So you can be sure that we're tested um, this test bomb and just take the community setup and install it in your environment. And yeah, and when we talk about upgrades, um, and that's also why we only support like one version. Um, if we have, for example, a new version with community setup 1.2.0, we may upgrade Gardner to 1.8. And then um, Gardner with uh, 1.8.0 also contain in his definition a migration from 1.7.0. So which means that with that, you also expect that you previously have installed community setup 1.2.0 um, or nothing. So installing from scratch should be, should be possible every time. Um, but yeah, with that, you see that we are, we are then expecting that Gardner with 1.7.0 is installed previously. Um, because yeah, migration can only happen from 1.7 to 1.8 and we cannot skip versions, which is one of our um, uh, prerequisites that I talked about in the beginning. Okay. Then when we have that in our system, um, we have there um, a different, so the, our entities live in different spaces. So for example, we have on our left side, we have an OCI registry. On the right side, we have the host cluster that is, that is still needed because landscape is a Kubernetes operator, so which means that it lives in an a Kubernetes cluster. And what also lives there are the data types and the landscape configuration. Um, and on the left side, we have, as I said, the OCI registry. Um, and there we have the, these um, definitions. So which means that in, in parallel to the Docker images that are already needed by Gardner in order to deploy any, any pods or any containers, um, we want to reuse the OCI um, specification and, um, and extend it with our own definition. So with that, we have some, some advantages because we do not need any additional system to ship our definitions to the customers or to, to anyone else. Um, and we can reuse something that's already there because you already need that. So um, uh, no new component and no new system that you need to, that you need to operate. Um, and so with that, uh, we're yeah, just reusing OCI registry and creating a new, um, a new component there or a new manifest there, which is, which is then our definitions. And in the, in the Kubernetes cluster itself, we also then have to create one installation, so which is the root installation. And in our example, it's the community. There we reference then the definition that is laid in the OCI registry. So which also means then that the landscaper fetches the template from the OCI registry um, and then creates based upon this definition, also the other installations that we define there. So for example, we have in the community um, definition, we have a Gardner uh, defined and a dashboard defined. So which means um, that the landscaper will fetch the definition from community, sees, yeah, okay, I have to create new references because my, my community installation references um, multiple definitions. So therefore I, oft, I also have to create installations for the gardener and for that and for the dashboard. And with that, it will then also um, recursively deploy all the items that are defined inside of these components. Um, about the scheduling, I will come later to that um, because we also need special scheduling between these components because for example, you need in order to run um, or in order to deploy the dashboard or the gardener, you need a virtual um, garden. So therefore we also have to define some way of scheduling or some dependency tree there. And I think what's also interesting for you is that the left side is completely managed by us. So which means that all of these definitions are available in our, or will be available in our public GCR registry. And um, then the community members or the, the consumer of the landscape setup only needs to take care of these components on the right side. So which means that you have to manage the landscape configuration. You need to manage the landscape itself, obviously. We cannot install landscaper. And you need to um, have one 
um, and you need to have this one root installation managed by you. And this then can be managed um, in the GitHub that you're using inside your company or um, can be also by, uh, can be also managed by ACICD pipeline, by Flux, um, with any GitOps strategy, Argo CD, it doesn't matter because this is just a YAML or just a configuration that is deployed to a cluster and then the landscaper starts to deploy um, the things that are, um, that are configured and um, configured by you and contained in the definition itself. Okay, then let's go a little bit deeper because this is like the overall overview. Um, uh, so now I want to talk about the execution. So how do we really install things? So well, last said is that a definition also consists of these executors. And um, these executors are just like a list of, of different um, definitions on how to deploy things. And there we have also a extensibility concept because all of these executors are translated into so-called deploy items. So which means that uh, installation then schedules deploy items in a specific order. And these deploy items have a, have a type, which is in, in that example is container type. And then we have a separate controller that listens for deploy items of type, uh, of type container. And they then reconcile them and they do the actual work. So which means that the landscape itself doesn't know anything about deploying um, a container or about deploying any Helm chart or something like that. This is all realized with um, deployers that are living outside of the landscaper. Obviously, they are part of the default installation, so which means that we already provide a container deployer, Helm deployer, um, some basic manifest deployer that you do not have to do them on your own. Um, but with that concept, you can also add your own things. So which means that, for example, we imagine that Gardner is so complex that we have a own um, deployer or a own controller that is just um, deploying, upgrading, and managing a deploy item of type Gardner, for example. And so with that, you can also on this level easily extend the landscaper um, with your own components or with your own deploy items. Um, and just one example there um, is then, for example, we have a topology component that says, for example, I have these and these seats in my installation, install it, um, which means then that we have a deploy item that is posted in the system and then the specific deployer reconciles it and creates a seat. Um, and with that, we're also possible to do that behind a firewall because when we want to create a fence seat, we just post like the, the um, deploy item in our base cluster, but then we have in a fence cluster, so our soil cluster, we have another um, landscape led, so it's not a real landscape led, but just for the analogy with Gardner, we have um, inside this fenced cluster, we have also a smaller uh, landscape led with, a, with these deployers. And then they also watch the original host cluster and can then create this fenced seed inside a fenced environment. And with that, we are also possible to have not just one fenced um, seed, but also multiple. So which means that we can we can be with that thing everywhere that also Gardner is because we have the same, um, we need the same network. So which means that you, if you want to um, have Gardner inside your fenced, fenced uh, firewall, you also have to uh, make sure that Gardner or the Gardner can call back to its API server. And with that, we also have the same approach and can also then go into the same um, network directions or the same, the same um, networks as Gardner would be. And with that approach, you can also have this fully um, landscaper managed garden led of your soul. So which means currently you have to do everything on your own on behind the firewall because you need at least one uh, the landscaper need to have access to all landscapes. But with that approach, you do not have to do that. So with that approach, as said, we have the same requirements as Gardner um, and you can then have fully managed soils also installed behind a firewall or in a private cloud managed by this. So then we have like the basic execution architecture. Um, and then I want to talk about how we schedule things. Um, so how can we make sure that a virtual garden is installed before Gardner is installed? 
Um, and I already said that we have this concept of imports and export definitions. Um, so which means that for in this example, we have a DNS controller and an Nginx controller. And we have an DNS controller that imports a qconfig that needs to be installed and it exports a DNS class. And in the Nginx controller component, which obviously deploys the Nginx controller, um, we import a DNS class because maybe we need a DNS class for our basic um, for our basic DNS management. Doesn't matter in this case. Um, but with that, we all have them, them in the status, in the initial status, because um, we see then that our imports are not satisfied, which means that they do nothing. And as soon as we deploy our landscape config, which contains then the cube configuration key, um, our imports of the DNS controller are satisfied. So which means that with, with the beginning of the, of the landscape configuration, we trigger our DNS controller, which means that their imports are satisfied and we can run. So we can execute our templates because we have all information that is needed and we produce our export when we're completed, our DNS class. And as you might see there, the DNS class that is exported by the DNS controller is imported by the Nginx controller. So which means that then our imports are also satisfied, which then triggers the Nginx controller execution. So with that, we then execute our Nginx controller and also produce the exports of the Nginx controller. And I showed you there the, the happy case on how we schedule things. Um, but uh, I think in a case where, in the upgrading case, which is most cases, we cannot do that thing. So therefore we have, we track also config um, generations. So which means that anytime a configuration, um, oops, a configuration of, for example, the landscape config changes, so for example, we previously reconciled our DNS controller with the generation zero of the landscape configuration and that, inst uh, that uh, configuration changes in anything. Then we increase the generation there, which means that we then also trigger because our imports are run with an outdated version. So with that, we combine like our observability of imports and exports. So we see where data flows because we see that the import of the DNS class is produced by the DNS controller so we can see if anything goes wrong. Let's just see where data is imported and maybe where the data is, is wrongly created. And uh, we also have our scheduling with that. Um, so, we, so we have the same um, safe mechanisms for observability of data flow also for the execution flow because we say um, when, we, when we import some data from a component, that component needs mm -hmm. to run before. Yeah, any questions? Okay, seems not to be the case. Um, and yeah, and this is how we imagine. There's a question the... in the chat from Ye Tiao. Ah. Um, I currently cannot read it. One second. Chat. Um, Check at the bottom. So how the controller got triggered utilizing message queue or each controller list in cube states. Um, so how the controller got triggered? You mean what controller? You mean in that? Oh, sorry. I think he means made... in that picture because there it is like depicted if the left thing would trigger the right thing, but it's actually just a controller that watches that something changed in the system and then acts. So it's not that the landscape config would like push some message to some message queue and that would be consumed, but it's pretty standard Kubernetes mechanics. So the controller something, so the some resources and watching them and acting upon changes on the custom resources. Yeah. So it's, it's just in that, in that picture to say, yeah, we have something that triggers us, um, but yeah, the watch loop is obviously behind. So the obviously is the other way around. So the DDS controller watches landscape config, as Dieter said. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I want to go a little bit more into detail. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is the actual um, definitions of how they look like in, in YAML or how the CRDs look like. And therefore I want to start with the easiest type is the data type. 
So already said that um, we want to have that as Open API spec, Open API V3 spec. So for example, if you want to describe um, a image, which consists of a name, a repository, and a tag, it would look like this in our case. So you have Open API V3 spec. It's of type object, and it has the properties name, repository, and tag, and all of them are of type string. And with that, I think you can describe all um, complex data types um, that are required. And as said, you already um, you always know that you get what you requested as soon as the type um, specifies it there. Yeah. Um, then definitions. They look like this. So for example, you also have a name and a version, um, which is the unique identifier of a definition. Um, and it's also the name that the landscaper then would look for in um, in the OCI registry to grab this configuration out of there. Um, then we have what we already talked about, the imports, which consists of a key and a type. So which means that this component expects a DNS class with as with key a DNS class, it ex expects um, the data of type string. Same thing for exports, um, the Nginx controller exports something on key engine X class and it's also of type string. And last thing are the executors um, where we define our deploy items that I previously talked about. I will go more into detail in some slides about how this is working, um, but this is like a basic definition. And we are, I also talked about that we want to have the possibility for aggregations. So aggregations are defined like this. You can have the same imports and exports and executions as in the basic type. Um, but additionally, you can also define definition references. And there you also see um, the same name and reference, which means that name is like a unique name in, in inside of that definition rest because you could have multiple, um, multiple definitions or definition references pointing to the same reference. Therefore, you need a unique name. Um, but there you can see then the reference, which is the reference to um, another component definition, which is then, as said, uniquely identified by its name and a version. And you can see that reference is pretty similar to how you define a Docker image with its um, repository and its tag. And what you also have there, because if you have multiple definitions, um, you would have multiple imports and exports with the same key. Um, which is not possible because we then not cannot determine um, which which one we should take or which one is the right one that we want. So therefore, you can also sorry. Therefore, you can also specify mappings, which are the next part where you define um, the mappings that are only occur inside of this specific aggregation. Um, so these imports are optional. So which means that if they're not specified, you just use the same import and export keys as defined by the component. But it's necessary if you have multiple components with the same um, inside the same system with the same um, import or export key. So therefore, you need some mappings to be then again uniquely inside of this specific context. And um, the last thing are the installations. So already said, they're just consisting of definition references, um, which are then there, reference to a definition, and um, the imports and exports that we previously defined, which means that we have here our import mappings defined, and that are then translated into the real system, so into the installation, um, which are the same here. For the root definitions, you can do them on your own, so which means that you can also um, do your own import and export mappings depending on your configuration or on your um, on your landscape configuration. So you can also map them um, to your organizational needs or to your own CI pipeline because maybe you have um, some other things in that configuration um, or maybe you want to, to struct them a little bit differently. So there you can also then overwrite our defaults and just use your own import and export definitions coming from outside. So, yeah, with that, um, I want to quickly come back and cover the last thing I want to talk about, and these are the deploy items. So we saw we saw that picture um, where we talked about the deploy items and the extensibility there. Um, so what are deploy items? So deploy items are 
just in this execution step a list of um, items that are of that have a type and a specific provider config, um, which means that then this configuration here is then translated into a deploy item and then picked up by the by the respective controller of in this uh, in this case of type container. And what you can also do there is you can do um, basic templating. So there we offer currently Go template, which means you can use the imports or um, or some some dependencies um, and just uh, template the configuration of a deploy item. And as I said, you can have multiple, so this list. Um, currently, we only plan that this is then a, a list of serial executions, so which means that the deployer, uh, sorry, not the deployer, the landscaper would first deploy um, the first execution, so the first deploy item, and it would wait until it finishes, then it would deploy the second deploy item, etc. cetera. Um, but we also plan to offer more um, more advanced features like defining a DAG, so a, a direct acyclic graph, um, so that you can run deploy items in parallel and maybe speed up the deployment a bit. But for the first thing, we only stick to uh, the serial execution of things. Um, and with that said, um, this is also some part of this extensibility that you can do because you can have multiple extension types. So for example, we offer Helm, a Kubernetes manifest, but we can also think of others like terraforming or some more specific installation types that are talked about like Gardner or anything like that. But basically you can do anything you want with that because it's just a CRD that is pushed to the Kubernetes cluster and it, it, it is expecting a deployer um, that is watching that and that is then doing the real work with that. And you can just use the whole um, configuration things and scheduling things that the landscape will offer you. And with that, I'm at the end. So with coming to Q&A, any questions? Let's look at the chat. Um, if you need custom logic for extensibility, you need to add your own controllers. Um, so if you need really, so if you need real, let's say, um, complex migration logic, I think yes, but you can also have, so we also offer a script deployer or container deployer, so which means that you, if you just have um, Python code as running anywhere, you can just write it in Python and then say, yeah, I want to run that code with that container. Um, and you do not have to write your own, write your own controller because if you're not suitable with that, I think that's not the best idea for, for starters. Um, you can also do that with just basic um, images. So just write your Python program or your bash program that does some things, um, just kubectl applies some things, then we're also good to go. So you can just use the container deployer that is um, provided by us. Any other questions? Seems everybody's impressed for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then thanks, Tim. Uh, and we yeah, come to our you. second topic. Uh, Georgi, it's your turn. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, now share my screen. Give me a sign where we're good to go. Oh, I can see your screen. Okay. And with so many components out there, you obviously need documentation for them. So <laughs> let's make a slight turn. <laughs> that was missing and in the diagram. Is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's make a slight turn now and then uh, see how the usual stuff goes around documenting things. Uh, obviously, our journey starts from uh, the documentation repository, which you need to uh, clone somewhere locally so you can make changes to that. Um, I'll skip that obvious part. So I here locally have uh, cloned already a documentation repository. Uh, started my visual code inside it. Uh, and here it is. 
and Sivan made a few changes here to a Knative tutorial that we had to take over uh, on our site. It used to be at the Knative site uh, because they changed the, the concept for the documentation and uh, scoped it only to strictly uh, Knative uh, stuff and linking just to, to outside. Uh, taking over this uh, particular material required some a little bit refactoring of the text because uh, you know there are some internal links to that were relative, so we had to convert them to uh, absolute and stuff like this. It's not the it, for for these kinds of that I'm doing. It's not uh, very essential what kind of change you need to do, but let's say you need to do any kind of change. Uh, notice that. Um, Every every documentation material, every markdown starts with uh, this slide metadata. So whether you are starting a new document or you're editing an existing document, you need to have this piece on top. Uh, I won't spend too much time now on uh, what you need to provide. Uh, I'll spare this for another session where we'll talk about uh, options here because it's kind of too, quite quite many options. I won't be able to fit into five minutes with this. Uh, but basically you need to provide a, a title, uh, a type, which is docs in our case, because uh, uh, we are doing documentation changes and uh, then they're going to be laid out as, as docs. Uh, a couple of categorization uh, properties and eventually some aliases, which uh, add additional paths uh, to, to reach your, your document here. Uh, now I'll just add to that that basically you have two big families of uh, document types for the documentation. One of which is what you see like a local do document and there is another big family that's uh, remote documents. It's not a family, it's actually a type. Uh, that's, that in essence uh, is a proxy to, to a remote material. So if you want to grab a markdown that's not in the documentation repository but uh, in some other repository in GitHub, basically you need to, to type something like remote here, and then the, the URL of, uh, of the markdown document. The build system is going to take it over and basically place the text uh, inside uh, this document. Just mashing. Now, uh, I've already done the changes here, not to bore you with uh, this stuff. And the next thing we will, we will want to do, here I've already tried it, I'll scroll a little bit down. To show the next thing we want to do is uh, to see how these uh, changes look like. So what we'll do here in the documentation repository, the clone of the documentation repository, just make surf. Uh, here the prerequisite is that uh, you need uh, to have Docker installed locally. And basically it starts a container that's uh, going to uh, fetch the latest version, if you see on the back, uh, going to fetch the, the latest version of uh, the website generator uh, that we have from the, from its repository and uh, build a Hugo site with it and uh, run it for you. Eventually it's going to spit out this URL where it's serving the content. The content is uh, actually uh, mounted in this container. Uh, from your cloned, local cloned uh, documentation repository. And there you have the whole Gardener website locally for you. You can check, for example, in tutorials, native. Here you can browse and uh, check for changes that you do. And changes are appearing in real time. So for example, if we uh, type something, I don't know, whatever nonsense here, we save it. And if we scroll back, you see automatically the change appears. So it, this is one easy way to, to preview before you, you publish. Of course, you can, for when you write new material, you can use the native preview of the, your favorite editor, but keep in mind that it obviously doesn't render one-to-one -to, -one to what you're going to see uh, on the website. Uh, and that's, that's the essential part. Uh, once you're satisfied with uh, your changes, obviously you can commit them to, to the repository. Before I proceed, I just wanted to to mention that uh, this makes surf is basically a script that's uh, a little bit of uh, scripting sugar around bringing up a container. That's exactly the same container that uh, our CI CD is, uh, is using. So essentially it's a reproducible central build 
from the concourse. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can expect uh, the same results uh, locally as uh, after a concourse build. Uh, you can, at, at any time, you can exec into the container and uh, perform a full build because what, what you see right now, for example, is uh, building whatever it has locally. But if you have uh, like those remote files that I mentioned, you, you need a full build so that the build system can go out there and grab the material and bring it uh, locally. Uh, but that's just in case you need, uh, you're working on remote material. For all other cases, you can use this simple way to, to preview our changes. And uh, should you, for some reason, you're constrained, for example, there are some quicks and uh, some uh, weird stuff that you need to do in uh, if you're in the uh, Windows Linux subsystem uh, on Windows 10 or for whatever reason you don't have Docker or you don't want to use the Docker, you can fall back to a completely uh, local setup, which is uh, less intimidating than it sounds. It's basically you need to install Hugo locally uh, and the website site generate, call on the website generator repository and create one um, symbolic link and you're good to go. Actually, all this is um, described in the, in the readme here of the website generator. So I encourage you to take a look. Now, if I submit this, which I bravely will, just kill it. Uh, okay. Uh, here, just to show you, I want this stuck in front int. Uh, all commits that uh, start with int, uh, you're not shown as, as a contributor to, to the site. I use them, for example, if I need to, to make some uh, cosmetic changes or if I need to do some infrastructure changes as maintainer of uh, the documentation so that I don't appear as a collaborator to, to the actual material. So fixes in generative material, something. And, Finally, I'll push. I won't bother with that, but um, at the end of the day, uh, you will see after you push, maybe a, a minute or seconds after that, uh, if you browse to, to concurse, you're going to see uh, the website uh, starting to generate. It takes like uh, maybe a minute and a half and you can change your, uh, check your changes live. And should there be some problems there at the concourse site, uh, again, in this readme, the website generator, there is a short how-to, you can debug uh, changes in the containers of the, of the concourse uh, build, build uh, job for, for the website. And that's pretty much it as, uh, as a workflow. Should you have any questions, you can shoot them now, or you can reach out to me on the Garana, on the Garana channel in, the, uh, in our workspace. Thanks, Georgi. Any questions to this uh, presentation? If not, we are at the end of our uh, meeting and uh, have a nice weekend and see you next time. Bye.